All right, so welcome everyone to last 100 yards intro. Um, if uh, you, you may recognize me from the Facebook group for last 100 yards, maybe from Board Game Geek and so on. Um, I'm just a fan of tactical games and uh, I was talking with uh, one of you guys uh, come on early that, uh, you know, we really love Combat Commander. Uh, I think this is a good, uh, Another good tactical offering from GMT. I think it plays pretty smoothly once you get the hang of it. And, uh, you know, it's got some good chaos and some things that, that Mike, the, the designer, Mike Denson, said he wants to um, sort of model battlefield behavior. And so I think that kind of takes that into account. Um, the first thing I would note about the game is it's one of only two tactical games that I know of, the other one being Combat Infantry, uh, which is a block game from Columbia. Anyone familiar with Combat Infantry or Columbia block games? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, the, I've got the, it, but I haven't played. Okay. So that one also organizes the units by companies and platoons. So, you know, a company would typically would contain three platoons and then the platoons are broken down into three squads and then some supplemented by, you know, additional uh, weapons units like mortars or machine guns or whatever. Um, but, but those two games are the only ones I know that sort of um, make that, that force structure a part of the game. So, you know, like in Comet Commander, even ASL, you know, you get leaders and stuff and they're important, but they're not necessarily bound to um, individual squads or platoons uh, at that sort of level of organization. So, and, and the way it's organized in last hundred yards then is by, com there's two companies, each, each side has two company or two companies uh, and then the three platoons from those companies. So uh, the, the Americans have uh, Abel and Baker and the Germans have first and second company. Um, and the way that's organized then is, uh, is how the game plays because of the, the way that you, uh, you act and react. So if you look at the Vassal module that's uh, up on the screen here, um, this is just uh, the pieces and uh, map, uh, the sector for uh, mission number one. And this is a simple, uh, simple um, uh, mission where, you know, you got the two platoons of attacking Germans trying to take positions from a platoon of uh, Americans. Now let me see here if I can hide this thing because nice. Um, all right. So um, if you'll note then on the game track, so the typical game of last hundred yards, if, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is based on Every, every game will have a score. So every, side, every game has an attacker and a defender. And the score is going to be, the final score is going to be whatever the time number is. So let's say, you know, we're at 36 minutes, elapsed time, and the Germans have taken two more casualties than the Americans. Um, you take the total time, and then you add to it this small number on the casualty track. I think so we're still case, seeing just the map. What's that? We're Are still you? just seeing just the map. Okay, I don't know. Let's see how to share this window here. Let me see if I can. Oh, okay. So that's a separate window. Sorry. There we go. So if you if you if you look at the the game track, um, the um, so again you have the time over here. So each turn uh, you're going to roll the die, and you between two and five minutes will elapse, and then wherever the casualty marker is, this small number here. Uh, is going to be added to the time. So here's 36 minutes plus six, where the casualty marker is, that would be a score of 42. So then the basic, the basic mission for every mission is um, the score is generally going to be the lower the score, the attacker is going to win. And then there's a, you know, about a 10 point draw area. And then after that, a final score of which the defender will usually win. Now the scenarios that come with the game um, all have different, uh, they have that sort of base mechanic, but a lot of them have different uh, victory conditions too, such as securing certain areas and, and, and this sort of, sort of thing. I mean, you get mission objective points. So there's, there's a pretty good, uh, there's pretty good variety on that. Let's see. All right. Sorry. And put this back up. There we go. Okay. So uh, the, the basic sequence of play is that <clears throat> Uh, you're going to roll. You're going to roll for initiative, and whoever wins the initiative then is going to be the active player, and only the active player can activate the their their units. Everything out, the other player can only react with their units. Okay, so 
typically the first thing that's done is uh, you choose a company. So for example, in this, in this particular mission, the Germans have the initiative, so they're going to get to select a company. Now, they, they, the black circle there indicates a second company. So second company is, um, that's the only company they have. So they, they don't really have a choice there. They say, well, you're going to activate second company. And then once they select a company, you select the platoon for activation. So here your choices are second platoon or third platoon. Now, when you choose your company, you can also make a coordination role. And typically, if that number is eight or more, you have the chance to activate two platoons at once before you have to call for reaction. Okay, so let's say the Germans roll their eight, they could activate all their units, both from second and third platoon, before they have to call for reaction, which then gives the Americans a chance to respond and so on. Okay, clear so far? Yes. All right. Yeah. Yep. That's a, that's a part of a Zoom meeting where everybody answers at once and not sure whether they're supposed to say anything, right? <laughs> So as an example, so, and then the heart of the system then is the action and reaction. So typically the active player will, will activate his platoon, uh, move or fire with the units or recover if they need to. Uh, each unit can do one action per turn and your options are moving, maneuvering, uh, maneuvering, firing, or recovering. Okay. Uh, and then of the, like, of the firing and the maneuvering, there's some subsets of different things you can do. So for example, um, a maneuver action can be simply moving a unit, or it could be withdrawing a unit towards your side of the board. Or you could deploy a squad and then uh, move the two sections, you know, split them up and, and do some things like that. Firing is, you know, what it says, you shoot at the enemy units. Um, and then uh, recovery, if you have regrouping units, uh, which usually happens because of you, you're sort of discombobulated after an assault, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat in the same hex, or if you're disrupted, you, if you're a disrupted unit. So for example, this is um, this guy here, you know, they're disrupted when they flip over, which is, you know, a lot of games we call that broken or whatever, but uh, disrupted in this game. Um, so the, uh, what happens then is, you will activate a platoon. So let's say for the case of uh, just an example here, it's the Germans turn, they're the active player. They did not roll coordination, so they can only activate one platoon at a time. Um, we'll say we'll activate second platoon. So that's Lang and his guys here. Now, um, assume that they're stacked something like this, all right? Um, we'll put Lang with a squad and then two squads together. Um, now, normally when you, when you, if units are coming in from off the board, you would stage them. So he's got to come in under this, they've got to come in under this first hex here, right? Um, yeah. So we'll move them in there, all right? And then they'll move into here, all right? We'll move this whole stack into here, and this stack into there. We'll, we'll do something like that. Now in the game, Units move, uh, they have a set number of movement points that, they're, that, that they can use. For infantry units or um, non-vehicle units, the active player gets three movement points. The reacting player only gets two movement points. Now having said that, the active player can always move two hexes no matter what. The reacting player can always move one hex no matter what. So for example, the woods or the forest uh, forest is the darker green and woods are the lighter green. Um, that costs one and a half for uh, non-vehicular units. So if I got my three movement points, I go one, one hex, uh, two and a half, that's going to be done uh, for Lang and his men. But the other guys, they've got three movement points in the clear, so they can uh, zoom on ahead uh, like that. Okay. Now at this point, everybody in the platoon has acted. If you have units um, like support weapons like machine guns, they're activated along with the platoon that they're closest to. So for, for example, in this situation, we could have this machine gun stacked with Lang and his men. Uh, and uh, then uh, he would activate with second platoon. So if the machine gun was over here, and let's say you had, you know, third platoon over there, then as long as they're, if he's close to either platoon, you can activate that machine gun with either of the platoons. Um, but otherwise they activate with the closest platoon. Okay, so far so good. So now at this point, when the, um, 
when the Germans have finished doing everything they want with their activated units, they will call for reaction. Now, in this particular instance, I don't know, let's put some Americans here in, in some buildings and stuff. All right. Now, the Americans did not see any of those actions occur. They didn't see the, um, they didn't see the Germans. So if you don't see any units, enemy units act, you normally cannot react. Okay, so in other words, in order to react, you have to observe an enemy action, whether it's a recovery, a fire maneuver, whatever it is, in order to react. Now, there are some limited act actions available, and the key one uh, is that a, a platoon leader can always do a limited reaction um, along with any units that are stacked with him or adjacent to him if he's in a, if they're in a clear hex or on a road. So, um, so if we got like this, this sort of thing here where Jackson and the squad and the squad behind him are on the road, the Germans moved up. The Americans did not see that, but as a limited reaction, uh, Jackson here with his men could activate himself, the squad, he could activate the other squad that's behind him and they could move around or do something or recover if they needed to, so on. The one rule about reacting is that you can never shoot at a unit that you did not see act. Okay, so even in a limited reaction, you can't shoot at, um, you can't just shoot at whatever you want. You're, I guess, modeling the, the small unit behavior, you're gonna be shooting at units that, that did something in your line of sight. All right, so we put him back there, put him back there, put him back there. All right, any questions so far? It's, it's pretty general stuff. Um. Hey, I, I, I got a, just a really dumb question. Uh, you're looking at mission one here, and yeah. it says like the, American, the Americans get seven steps of units. Yes. I, could you just clarify how you count that up? Because I, for Thank some you. reason, can't feel confident on that one. Yep. So a combat step. So you're looking at combat steps, right? So any infantry unit, which is the, the, the army guys, the leg guys, are combat steps. Um, a squad is always two steps. All right. And let's see, if I pull this, I don't know, you probably can't see see this, but if I pull a couple of sections here, all right, so every squad is really made up of two sections. So I could take this, let's say this squad here that I've highlighted, I could take that off the board and replace it with these two guys. Those are sections. So a section is a single step, okay? Um, a machine gun is, a, every unit really is a single step other than an infantry squad. An infantry squad is two steps. So we got two, four, six, seven steps. Platoon leaders are not combat units for the purposes of steps and casualties. They can take casualties because they could be eliminated um, and move to the time track and then they come back later like a field promotion or something, but they don't count for actual casualties. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, absolutely, and that's what I was doing, but I just, I wanted confirmation, thank you. Yeah, so. So yeah, the, there are some units in the OOB that are not considered combat steps. So that's why that total step that's listed there can be a little bit confusing at first. Right. So yeah, because you're like, well, I got, well, I got, you know, five counters, but I got, you know, right? So I got the three squads, that's two, that's six. I got the machine gun, that's seven, but Jackson doesn't count as a step because he's not gonna the steps, combat steps, uh, the 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 significance there is that they will move the casualty track. Anything else doesn't. So in the game, um, I think the game that all the stuff that's included in it, the only non-combat steps would be uh, platoon leaders, uh, light anti-tank weapons like the bazookas and the panzer shreks, uh, and trucks. So everything else would be a combat step. Um, half tracks, AFVs, uh, and so on. So we'll put these guys up here in the, uh, you know, we'll put them up in the woods and so on and just to, uh, Put the machine gun up in the woods. We'll put the squad up in the house, pretend he took the house. Okay, so now we got some, some guys here. I'll put this guy back with Jackson. All right, there we go. All right. 
So now just if you look at the if you look at the map now, uh, let's say again, it's another turn, some minutes have passed, whatever. Let's say again that the Germans have initiative. Okay. So um, where's our guy here? There's there's Lang. Um, there we go. So we're gonna activate the Germans are gonna act, let's say they don't get coordination again, so they can only activate one platoon at a time. Uh, Lang's going to activate second platoon. Now this guy over here, um, I don't know, he can stay put or whatever, but let's say that Lang wants to move his men or, or maybe put some fire on these guys. So he's going to have the machine gun fire at the American machine gun. We'll assume all these positions are, you know, not hidden or, or concealed for the moment, uh, just for illustration. So the machine gun's going to fire. You look at the combat table, uh, the small arms table, uh, you, there's the first thing you look at as a modifier for the range. All right, so a 12 range, the 12 is the superscript there. 12 range machine gun firing three hexes, no problem. So there's not gonna be any modifier there. Um, the building, a wooden building is, is gonna be a, a two modifier. So it's gonna be a minus two total modifier. So minus two, and then you have one firepower means that the, um, that this unit is going to get a minus one uh, marker on it. So far, so good. So, and then typically you would mark the German unit with a fire marker. Okay. So, let's, for the sake of argument, say that that's the only unit that um, that the Germans activate at that time. Now, if you are the active player and you activate your units, so so you're activating your platoon. If you don't give an order to a unit, that unit can't be given an order later, but it can react, okay? So for, for, for the sake of our example, let's say the only machine gun has fired now, and so the Germans say, you know, pass it to the Americans for reaction. So now the Americans can react, all right? So let's say, I don't know, let's say, maybe it's not good tactics or whatever, but the machine gun wants to fire back at the, you know, fire back at the machine gun. So their range is a 10. They got a range uh, and three hexes away is not gonna be a modifier. That's, that's still uh, close enough. So the woods are gonna give a cover of one. And since there's already a fire marker on the machine gun, that's gonna be an additional minus one. So the American machine gun fires with a minus two, which is gonna put a net, um, a net minus one counter on that one, on that stack, okay? Now, this American unit also saw that fire, okay? So since that Amer this American unit saw that machine gun fire, if you trace down, um, where's our line of sight thing here? If you trace down the hex spine, um, it would own, the woods would only, the forest would only block if it were on both sides of the line. So that's a clear line of sight. So this squad returns fire. One, two, three, four. That's gonna be a minus one because of range. Another minus one because of the, um, the woods. So they're also going to get a net minus one marker on it. So with a minus two total and a minus, so that makes a minus one, all right? So we will mark these guys as fired. And that's just, these markers here, um, they're just a reminder to the players which units have acted or reacted. So all my Americans that saw this marker over here on the Germans can react to that unit because they saw him do something, okay? Um, now, the German, so now, now say the Americans returned fire, then they pass the reaction back to the Germans. Now remember this stack, we activated second platoon, but they didn't do anything. Now they can react since they're available to react. So let's say now they're gonna put fire on this, on this guy here. So again, he's in a wooden building. Their range is 10, uh, you know, the range is three, their, their limit is 10. So it's gonna be a net minus two. So this guy is gonna get a couple of, See if I can, yeah, they're okay. So both minus one, right? So they're gonna, so these guys here have fired. So we'll put the fire marker there. So 
the Germans having fired back at that guy, um, they've reacted. So that's all they want to react to. So Mark? Yeah. So that third platoon there could also react too, right? This if one here? Want. This one up here? The third platoon, sorry. Yeah, third platoon could as well. So okay. um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point, Todd. So any German units that haven't acted are, are available to react. So now we haven't activated third platoon yet to do its normal actions, but they are in line of sight of the enemy. So for example, this squad um, could throw down another, uh, put a marker there and we mark, then we would mark him fired as well. So the Germans activated second platoon. They only fired the machine gun and they call for reaction. The Americans are like, yeah, we're firing back. So they fire back. Then the Germans react by firing back at the Americans. Now, then the Germans say, all right, that's it. Now back to you. Now, for whatever reason, it's the Americans' reaction. And, and he says, you know what? Jackson didn't necessarily, yeah, I, he might have seen this fire here. Um, not, no, because of the building. So Jackson did not see the fire. Although, let's see. Oops. Let's see, can he see? Yeah, I guess they would have seen they would have seen this unit fire. But whether they saw it or not, Jackson, since he's since he's a platoon leader and the unit that's stacked with him, um, they could move over here just as a limited reaction. They don't need to have seen. Okay. And that's only because there's a leader in the hex, right? Correct. And again, if there were any units, so if he was in the clear or on a road, any units adjacent to him could also be activated for a move order, for maneuver action. So let's say the American sh shot, then the German shot back, and then the American said, well, I'm going to move Jackson down there. So they do all that stuff. And then they pass it back to the Germans. The Germans say, we're done. So that concludes the... Um, Oops, what did I just, what did I, yeah, so that concludes that uh, platoon activation segment. So you can pull these markers off. Okay. Now, typically in face-to-face uh, -face play, um, you might rotate your guys just so that you know, um, that they've been that they've already been activated this turn. Um, Vassal makes it kind of easy because it'll 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 mark them as activated um, if you, you move them or you can mark them activated. So there's different ways to do it as long as you know that those units can't do any more actions this turn. So that's the end of what's known as the platoon activation cycle. So do you have any more platoons left? Yeah, we got third platoon that still hasn't done its stuff yet. So now we activate. Germans say, all right, now we're activating the third platoon. So third platoon is going to do some actions. Um, like crazy, crazy guys will just uh, run this squad up here, okay? Um, and then this squad, let's go one, two, three, I don't know, maybe we'll try and come around for the flank in the church or whatever. So again, um, Rolf, one, two, he's going to move into this hex with this squad, lead these squads over here to do their thing. So that's all the stuff for third platoon. So we throw it back to the Americans. Americans, reaction. Well, the only guy that's left on the American side that could activate would be this squad here. Remember, these guys already did their thing. We'll tap, do it like that. So we got the squad in the church that could activate. He could fire at these guys here. Um, he can't really see these guys. He could sit tight. So he could act. He could, you know, run back to here. He could just sit tight, whatever. Um, but either way, if he doesn't do anything, he's going to pass it back to the Germans. And the Germans, of course, have no more units to activate. So the platoon activation cycle is over. Now, if they had another company on the, on the map, then they could activate the second company and then pick which platoons are activating, check for coordination and so on. So it really just goes back and forth until the active player is done and all the reactions have been finished. So any, any, um, any questions about the sequence or how that works? Um, <clears throat> so remind me again, the squad, third squad in the church, they had no line of, oh, I guess he saw, he could, he saw Rolf. Yeah, he saw Rolf move into there. So, okay. he, yeah, so, um, yeah. All right. 
so then, since Rolf moved in there. Um, yep, okay. At, yep, anybody else? After, um, after all the platoon activations been done, then you resolve fire. So the way that fire is resolved is you roll a die for each marker that's on the, on, on the units. So in this case, we'd roll 3D10. All right, I got a six, a one, and a six. So you, you, you just add, you, you add or subtract whatever the modifier is. So that makes it a five, a zero, and a five. So you look at the unit. If the, if the final number, and in the case of multiple die rolls, you only take the worst result for the target. So I don't know. I can need a I need a better spread of rolls here. Oh come on! <laughs> oh jeez! Give me there we go. All right, so there, there we go. So let, let's try that. So we got a nine, a zero, and a six after you, you take into account those markers. Okay. Um, if it is more than the cohesion, that's the bottom right number. Put them back straight. So I can see what I mean. But the bottom right number is their cohesion. So if the if the if the result is higher than that cohesion, then that unit is going to disrupt. If it's equal or less, nothing happens. And you always check the best combat unit in the hex. So for example, let's, let's put this squad in there. Um, if that squad were in there, um, that that's a better cohesion than the other squad. So that the, the uh, it, you know, if the final result was a six, that would be enough to break the five if he was by himself. But if the six cohesion units in there, he's not going to break. But with that 10, which is really a nine, um, the unit would break and any other units in the hex would also have to make a cohesion check. Again, if you roll equal or less, you're okay. If not, you're going to disrupt. Now, if the roll is 10 or higher, you check the best combat unit and that will automatically disrupt and take a casualty. So that squad would be replaced with a disrupted section and then every other unit in the hex would have to make a cohesion check. Um, and that's how you resolve the fire. So you just, and you know, the order of the fire doesn't necessarily matter. You can, you know, take turns or however, you, you know, whatever you do, usually one side does it, then the other side. Um, Cause fire is all simultaneous. What's kind of interesting about the fire, um, let's, let's pretend here for a moment. Um, where did our, where did he go? There he is, all right. Um, so if you, have, if you have this whole stack here, um, supposing, for example, this squad here, I'll go back to the platoon phase where we're activating units. Let's say th these two guys had three fire markers on them. If I activated this squad to, let's say withdraw, withdraw lets you go one to four hexes towards your board edge, um, really without counting movement points. So he just wants to withdraw. He's gonna try and get back a little bit safer or maybe just move back to here, whatever. Um, the German player would then decide which of those markers would follow that unit. So let's say the Germans want two of those markers to, to go on to that guy, because I mean, that's better odds of breaking because he's a low cohesion, you can do that. So if, if a unit is by itself, he would take all the markers with him when he moves, but if there's multiple units, the, uh, the player that fired is gonna get to decide how those, how those uh, uh, die roll modifier markers are carried. It's kind of interesting. It's, I guess you're sort of visualizing, you know, they're, they're running around and the fires split and crossfire or whatever, and just kind of that, that sort of thing. But that's an interesting, uh, an interesting mechanic. Yeah. And they would also suffer those hits if they moved into those. Okay. Right. So, yeah. So, so, so you got, let's say they're all three on this squad. And for some reason, this crazy squad moves into there, then they will also be subject to that fire. Uh, so again, you're going to check the six guy, with the final roll, not the five, but if the six guy disrupts, then the five guy's gonna have to check as well, okay? All right, let's... Uh... Yeah, it's cool about that. I didn't, we, didn't, we didn't come across that mark when we played. Someone withdrew, that's interesting. <clears throat> so, um, 
a couple of considerations just based on the sequence of play and how things play out. Um, when a unit has a marker on it, no matter what the marker is, that machine gun is now suppressed. So you got suppressing fire on it. If, if you were to add another marker, so now there should, see, there should be two markers on there. So every two markers is gonna be suppression. So he's gonna have a minus one to his fire when he fires because he's got two markers. If he had one marker, two markers, it's a minus one. Throw another marker on there. Now he's got three markers. He's gonna be firing at minus two. So for example, let's say Lang's machine gun and these two squads put all that fire on him, then that's gonna make him, you know, minus two is actually quite a bit in this game. And so that's gonna make him, you know, certainly less effective for let's say, you know, if this guy wants to start moving and head toward this building over here. Some, some people are, um, Curious about the, the, the idea of op fire in the game, and there isn't per se with infantry units. So as, as this guy runs, as this guy moves, he can't be shot at. But again, when he's done and the Germans call for reaction, then the Americans could fire on him. Now the machine gun, any unit that ends its move within two hexes, if you fire at that unit in reaction, you get a plus one on the on your on your fire. So that that represents sort of the opportunity fire danger or the not low crawling or something you see in other systems that you're up to. You know, you're moving close in. Uh, you know, out. Uh, you know, not necessarily in the open, but you're moving close in, and so they got they got a better beat on you. So that's it's always dangerous as you're trying to get into um, range for uh, assaulting. Okay. Um, so far, so good. Can he, can he fire anywhere along that movement track? So what if he runs? He, he cannot. Out so, of line of sight, starts out of line of sight, runs through line of sight, and ends up out of line of sight. Can he shoot at him? He cannot. All right. So um, I'm not sure what, you know, what would be. Let's say you got, you got something like, let's say he starts over here. If he moves here and then here, I'm not sure. Let's say that's line. I don't, I'm not sure if the building is going to block that. It'd be close. It looks blocked to me, um, but he would not be able to shoot at him there. And, and that's the thing I think that throws some people in the game. Um, I think it's just the way that Mike has chosen to, to model it or whatever. Um, but um, so, you know, you're kind of making a dash for, for cover there. Now, if he could see him, of course, then he'd get that plus one, uh, plus one on the fire. All right, turn off line of sight tool. All right. He does like discuss that in the designer notes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel like he kind of makes up. I haven't read the designer notes yet, but I feel like he makes up for it with really pretty short uh, movement. Well, that's the thing. So, you know, the, the ranges of movement are pretty, are pretty short. So you can't just, you know, you can't run 10 hexes or five hexes or whatever. Um, you're going to, you're going to at most be going three hexes out in the open or two hexes through terrain. Um, so, yeah. And even the vehicles um, have short movement. So a, a tank can only move an activated player's tank only has five movement points and a reacting vehicle has uh, four movement points, reacting tank. So, so the, the, the range of movement is short. So it, it, I think that's a good point that it kind of makes up for that. Um, all right, any questions so far? Cool. We got 10 people on, Mark, that's pretty good. Yeah, I know, that's, uh, thanks all for, for coming out. Um, let's talk a little bit about assaults then. Um, and uh, <laughs> Todd, I'm thinking about our game the other night where you threw everything you had at, the, at Jackson in that hex. I, I got to go help the family do something. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been good having you, Todd. Goodbye. <laughs> um, assaults. There's a, there's a story there, guys. <laughs> All right. 
How do you make the guy stay on top of the stack? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like a vassal expert. Remember left arrow, right arrow, moves them up and down. No, top arrow. Thank you. You told me that. All right. Just for the sake of argument and example, we'll put these squads over here. We'll put Lang over there with them. All right. And then we will, you know what? I'm, I'm going to move Jackson back a little ways uh, just to illustrate this. I'm going to put this squad over here. No, I want, I got, I want second platoon. So they're all doing the same thing. Where's my, where's my other guy? Where's my other guy from second platoon? Oh, there's that. That's you. So let's put him down there. Sorry. All right, there we go. So, you know, the hexes are 50 meters or 50 yards. So you can assault from two hexes away, which of course would be the last hundred yards, right? There you go. Um, there's, there's two ways of entering an assault. You can enter an assault from an adjacent hex. If that's the case, you're just gonna take your, your unit and put it right on that, uh, right on that assault hex and then <clears throat> that is an assault hex okay but you can also assault from up to two hexes away so lang and his men are going to go here they're also going to of course they're going to have like 57 assault markers let's fix that So typically what you do is you will put, there's the. So when you're assaulting from two hexes away, you put the assault marker on to indicate, the assault arrow on to indicate that's where they're headed, but they're not quite there yet. Again, if you're adjacent, you're going to move straight into the hex, okay? What that does is units that are in an assault hex, in other words, the, the hex with the actual flag and the enemy units, can't do anything. They can't recover, they can't withdraw, they're stuck. So that's a way to pin the units in place until the assault phase of the game when they fight. No. Um, so if it's units that are under assault, meaning they don't have the enemy units in there yet, but they are just, they, they got the guys coming at them, they have some options. They can attempt to recover if they're regrouping or disrupted. They can fire, but only at an adjacent hex. And typically that would be you're shooting at the guys that are coming at you. Or they can, they can withdraw. So let's just put this German unit out of the way here. This guy here could withdraw backwards or you know, go even further if he wanted. One to four hexes, that's a withdrawal. Um, so, when, when they're charging you, you have a few more options than when they, you know, literally jump right into your hex, okay? Sure. Um, which is, you know, you know and again, if, if this unit here fired at them, he would get that plus one because they're moving. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty dangerous. So, so, you know, again, the better tactic is get these guys in here now so that you can pin them and then they can't do anything to the other guys coming in, all right? So for the sake of argument, we'll leave one squad there because in an assault, only you can only have four steps of non-vehicular units fighting in the assault. So you could have all three of those German squads there, but only two of them will be able to add their, their assault value to the, uh, to the pile. At the end of the platoon activation phase, all right, so let's say that was second platoon's activation on the part of the Germans. Um, the Americans react or don't react or whatever. At the end of that, then the whole stack would be moved into that hex, and that arrow then becomes the assault marker. I mean, you could take the other one off or whatever, but um, so then they're all there in the hex. Now, supposing that the Americans had fired on them and they would have put on, let's say, the Americans a one, they would have got a plus one, so they would have put a two marker on those guys. So our German pals here, um, if we move them back, we put a, um, so now they've got a decision to make. 
So let's say that the, the squad fires at them. Now they, they're running in there and they got, you know, fire in the face. They got a two on them. At the end of the platoon activation segment, so when, you know, Germans say, all right, we're activating number two. Here's what they're doing. Americans react. Germans react, whatever. Then it's all done. Second platoon's activation is over. That is when those assault units would be moved into the hex. At that point, they're either moved into the hex or the Germans could attempt to feint with those units and say, we're not going into the assault hex. If they're, with a cohesion check, if they're successful, they can stay in the hex. Otherwise, they have to withdraw. So they'd end up running towards their board edge. And again, that marker would go with whichever units the, uh, the Americans said, you know, that those, you know, split the squads, wherever that squad gets the, gets the marker uh, or however they want to do it. So anyway, so after you resolve all the fire, the next part of the sequence of play in the turn is the assaults. So let's say all of our fires resolved. We'll just kind of spread these guys out so we can see. They're all in that hex with the American. Um, essentially what you do, you add up their assault values, which are the blue numbers. Um, and then there's, there's a set of modifiers on the combat tables for uh, those, uh, those units. Just to make it interesting, we'll do this assault instead. So the first thing you check is, the best German combat unit, either one of these guys, they have a cohesion of six. Best American is co cohesion of five, that's plus one to the Germans. So the Germans have two, four, five, and then plus one for that cohesion difference, that's a six. The Americans have two, but they're defending in a rural building, that will give them one, so they're a three. So we got six to three, and you just compare it, and the difference is going to be the die roll modifier that the attacker gets. In this case, a plus three. So the Germans roll with a plus three. They get a 10. That's super bad for the, uh, the defender. Because the defender is going to have to retreat two to four hexes towards his board edge. He can go one hex if he goes into cover. But he's going to have to make a cohesion check. And at 10 on the assault table, if you look at that, if he, if he passes the check, he'll disrupt. And if he doesn't pass, he disrupts and takes a casualty. The normal range is two to five and six to nine. Um, a six to nine, they would have to retreat, make a cohesion check for all their units, uh, and then they would all be regrouping. So let's say that was a, let's say that was an overall nine result, right? These guys roll back. Let's say they pass their cohesion check. They would get, a regrouping marker. And if the result was six to nine, that means the attackers won, but they would also get a regrouping marker. All right. And no matter what, even if they fail a cohesion check, a leader always makes a leader check in addition to that. So if, if let's say the Germans, whether the Germans win or lose, they got a roll for Lang and a one or 10 will kill him. So he dies in the assault. And leaders that are killed go on the time track seven minutes ahead. So they're, they're and then their platoons really can't do any activations and they, they're, they're pretty limited in what they can do as far as the reactions. They can do normal reactions and stuff, but they, they, they can't really act on their own until their, their leader comes back. So that's how, that's how assaults are resolved. Um, you, you tally up the, the two sides, the difference is a plus or minus die roll modifier for the defender, and then you see who, who comes out. Questions on that? Um, when the American was firing, which we didn't do, but when he was firing on the assault coming in, yes, he had a plus two. Yep. That that would <coughs> be against the best cohesion unit in the stack. It right. wouldn't be split between them. Correct. So you so it's you always can you always compare the fire result to the best combat unit in the stack. So in this case, you've got this stack of Germans has got, they're both sixes. Now, a little, uh, a little bit of a, uh, a boost from the leader. If the leader's cohesion is greater than the best combat unit, so for example, the case we're looking at, the seven is greater than either of those sixes, um, that will reduce the final die roll by one. So let's say you rolled, you know, let's say you rolled an eight, with a minus one on it. So that would be a seven. Normally that would break those guys or disrupt it, disrupt one of them. But Lang reduces that even further uh, down to a seven or down to a six. 
and then that unit would be okay, so they wouldn't have to check. So it's it's pretty. Uh, the casualty rates are. I mean, if you roll high, if you roll a ten, you can do an instant casualty, and that certainly happens. Um, a little bit more often would be that you're just going to disrupt the best unit, and then the other guys are going to have to check. Um, typically, though, I mean, if they're in cover and stuff, it's going to be tough to to disrupt them too much. You're going to have to close and, and do it from a little bit closer range, and, and then you know run in for the assaults. So fire and maneuver is kind of the name of the game, and then the way the the way the action and reaction is set up makes it. Uh, pretty easy to do and pretty good way to, uh, you know, kind of and models it. Um, and again, once you've done it a few times, uh, it plays pretty smoothly. I don't know if, if you, if some of you guys have played it, you know, a few scenarios, would you say it gets kind of smoother as it, as it goes on? Absolutely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I find playing solo that sometimes it's too smooth. Yeah. Going from one side, reacting to the other and sure. Well, those are kind of the, the, the basics. Of course, the, the scenarios are laid out in such a way that it, it kind of increases the complexity. I think it's scenario three maybe that starts adding in mortars. Um, and then scenario five is the all tank scenario, all tank mission, which is a lot of fun. Um, and so there, there's some kind of neat ways I think that he models things to keep it streamlined and simple. Um, one, one is the way that tanks work without turrets and stuff. So uh, that they have, they enfilade. So if you, if you're moving, if your tank is moving, that indicates it's front and rear just for the sake of that reaction. Um, mortar fire is cool because it basically will pin, uh, if you use high explosives, it will pin the units in the impact hex uh, and they really have no options. They can't do anything except withdraw. And any unit that moves through there or withdraws from there would take the mortar fire right away. Um, and there's a pretty um, simple scatter diagram, um, or, you know, so essentially, uh, let's see, let me get an example here. Let's get, put some mortars on the board here, German markers. Uh, where's our forward observer? All right, so we got a forward observer here. Where'd he go? There's, let's, um, There it is. Let's just swap these guys out here a little bit. We'll do something like this. Okay. Um, you guys want to see a mortar fire example? Sure. sure. Definitely. All right. So, so suppose we got mortar. This is a mortar section, uh, which is the so mortars in the game are off board. Um, you have you have the smaller sections, which I think are I don't know. It's like two or three mortars or um, and then maybe the, a mortar platoon, which covers the whole company, would be like, I don't know, four to five or five to six or something. It's in, you, you know it's in the books. But essentially what happens is um, any units within a certain distance. So in this case, the Germans are the attackers. So they got to be within four hexes of a platoon leader. Um, anyone can, any, the platoon leader or combat units can call the mortar fire. And so before he takes an action, let's say uh, third squad here in the woods could call the mortar fire. So what he does is you drop the, the forward observer here as that's just sort of inherent to the, the, the squad and the platoon. So wherever he shows up, that's where he, he, he comes on. Um, and we're going we're gonna to fire some high explosive at these guys in the building. So we're going to put this marker here. Now, unless there's a hindrance, and the only thing that would hinder it would be smoke or more high explosive markers in between. Okay. So we're going to look at the game track here and oops, not that one. Combat tables. Hold on here. I got to switch the screen share. Um, so this is the, this is the combat tables. And what you'd look at is um, the type of mortar. So in this case, it's the eight centimeter section, the Germans. That primary, the primary die roll marker is going to be a two strength marker, okay? And a secondary is going to start at zero, all right? So remember those numbers, two and zero, and they're going to get one accuracy roll, which means one, the primary marker is going to go on the primary hex, and you're going to make one roll 
to see where the secondary goes. It might land in the primary hex or it would land in you know, one of the adjacent hexes. Um, so there's a modifier for air burst if it's hitting woods. Otherwise, um, there's a modifier for density. Density is if you have more than four um, non-vehicular steps. So if you had like three squads, it would you need a plus one for the density. That's the same for small arms as well. It's, it's not quite over stacking, but it's too much stacking. And then you get the terrain effect. So that's the wrong, wrong screen. All right, there we go. So remember that. So the uh, so this hex here. is going to get, let's see if I did this right, that, mar that marker. Remember, the initial strength is a two, but there's, uh, there's that wooden building there, which is going to give them cover. So that is going to be a net zero modifier. OK, makes sense? Mm -hmm. So then we have, one, we have one accuracy check to make. So let's roll the die, and we get a six. So if it's seven or higher, it's going to go in the, in the primary hex, the target hex. But if not, it's going to scatter according to the diagram on that sector. So if you guys can see that map 11, it's going to go 6. It's going to go to this hex here. Um, I can uh, clone that and move it there. There we go. So remember that the strength of a secondary marker was 0. So that'll just be 0. And there's no cover or anything to change that. So. This, this mortar fire then in this hex is going to be resolved during, during the regular fire step. Now, supposing the machine gun had fired before that, because otherwise he's going to get a minus one because he's firing into a high impact hex. So it's kind of, you know, hindrance uh, because the, you know, mortar shells going off. So back up here and retro retcon it to uh, have him having fired before that. If I, if I remember, he had a minus, uh, minus one, okay? So at the end of the, at the, end of the when, when the platoon activation is done, the fire resolution, you're gonna roll a die for each of those, and whichever one is the worst is the, gonna be the one that affects the unit. So for our example, unless we don't get sucky rolls, we got a four and a 10. So let's say the first one was the mortar, Four and zero is a four, a 10 minus one for the small arms is a nine. So the nine is what'll, what'll affect it. Or reverse it, say the first roll was uh, the small arms, and in case it's a three, the second was a 10, all right? Now, now you get to pick, I mean, you, you would designate which, roll, which die roll you're making for which marker, um, but that's how that works. So even if there's multiple, um, multiple different kinds of fire, small arms or mortar, you just roll a die for each one, and the worst one is gonna be the one that affects those units. Now, if there was a vehicle in there that had anti-tank fire on it, um, anti-tank fire is only applied to a single vehicle or a gun. So similar to other games, you, you target individual vehicles where small arms and um, mortars are gonna be just hitting everything in the hex. So, I mean, that's, that's how mortars work. Then at the end, so in the sequence of play, you do all the platoon activations, then you resolve the fire, then you resolve the assaults, then there's a mortar adjustment phase. So what happens there is that um, uh, if you, th the first thing that you do is you check for mortar recovery, okay? Which means if you have mortars that have been, uh, that, that are, uh, they're not available, um, you would roll to see if they become available. Then um, any units that were, on their final side. So you notice the, the forward observer guy has a final side. Um, if he had already fired and you didn't want to use him again, or he had fired twice, and so this was his second turn, he's going to come off the board into the pending box. So a mortar that fires goes to the pending box and won't be available until the following turn. Okay. So let's suppose, though, that was his first shot and he wants to keep up the fire. He flips him to the final side, and then he would make a roll to see whether he can uh, uh, get uh, continue that mortar fire. So I think for a section, he's got to roll a four or less. So if he rolls his four, uh, well, first he, he would he would keep the spotting round in the same place, or he would move he could move the spotting round into as long as he's got line of sight. But let's say he keeps it there, 
he gets um, he gets to continue with that mortar fire. Then uh, next turn, um, you go ahead and resolve that mortar fire. So we put the zero there. We would roll, see where the scatter is, a two, which is you know up there. Okay, and then he's on his final side. So next turn for sure, that mortar, that that for, forward observer is coming off. Okay, so mortar, and then you know mortar fire is kind of all those things. Are you going to get it? Or are you not going to get it? Are they going to respond to your your, your request or, or not respond to your request? All right, let me put this back up for a second. Oops. Sorry, guys, hang on one second. All right, you see the time track again? Yep. So, and again, the whole sequence of play is there. So we, we've done the initiative phase, the activation phase, you do the fire resolution, do the assault resolution, do the mortar steps. Um, then you'll roll for the time lapse. Whoever's got the initiative would roll. Uh, and then, you know, you would see where they would end up as far as how far the time advances. Um, then you would take motion markers off the tanks. Uh, if you've got platoon leaders coming on, if you have two sections that are together in the same platoon, you could recombine them into a squad. Um, conceal units that are out of line of sight. Um, reset the counter orientation if you were twisting them to, you know, keep track of who acted or so on. Then you check victory conditions or end of game stuff and see, uh, see what was done there. And then if the game's not over, you uh, you go again. Good, 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 good. A lot of the uh, a lot of the scenarios, a lot of the missions, and even if you uh, they don't start that way, we'll let you have concealment. And concealment's nice because it's you you can't look at stacks that are concealed. I mean uh, uh, your opponent stacks, and it gives you a minus one to their fire. So those are helpful. Um, there's a set of conditions where concealment comes off. You know, if you're, uh, if you move within three in cover, or if you fire within two, then that's going to come Or If you're moving out in the open, I think like eight or 10 hexes or something, um, it's that the concealment's going to come off. Um, and a lot of the missions will start with the option for hidden units too. Uh, Vassal's pretty helpful with that because you can just, you can hide them and then, you know, they can't see, uh, until you check line of sight, right, Todd? And you're like, oh, I, you must have a guy there. <laughs> um, so. But that's, uh, I mean, that's the gist of it. I and mean, the heart of it is the active player is the only guy that can do stuff. And the other player is reacting to that. And then the active player can also react to reactions. So once the active player is done acting, it's reactions back and forth until everybody passes. And then the active player says, okay, next platoon, here's what they're doing. Reaction, 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 uh, and so on. So like I said, the, the, the more you play it, it just it's really fast and smooth and, uh, and a lot of fun. So. Good. Anyone have any specific questions or things that uh, they weren't sure about or? Yeah, I got a newbie question. Um, yeah, absolutely. Can you kind of just show an example of the blind hex procedure? Uh, yes, let me, uh, we're gonna have to change maps here. Yeah, I get some oh, yeah. um, contours or something. But that's a good one. <clears throat> contours, yeah. Let's see. Hold on one second. Um, let's go backwards. Mission. Um, yes, good old map number ten. You know where the the hill and woods. Yeah, it's woods and hills. So it's pretty awful. <laughs> Where we go here? All right, here we go. All right. So the blind hex, um, the blind hex procedure, you're, you're simply trying to decide whether um, how many blind hexes, um, you know, you can see past an obstacle. Um, let's, let me find a good, uh, good line of sight here. In order to do this, we're going to assume that the levels, like they are in a lot of missions, are times two, all right? So, so this one is really level two, and this, this part of the hill is level four, okay? Does that make sense? Everyone makes sense to everybody? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, okay, so 
uh, what the blind hex does, so we'll put a guy, um, I don't know, we got an infantry guy here. Well, let's let's do machine gun because machine guns. Uh, infantry. So we'll put a machine gun up on the hill. German units, support the right wing, valid. Okay, so the gist of it is that um, we want to know whether this guy can see uh, this guy down here because he's shooting over trees. So the woods are level uh, two. I got that right. Yeah, that's now. Sorry, woods are level one, forests are level two. So that's this is woods that he's shooting over. So this is level one. Okay, he's on level four. So if you look at the terrain table, which I'm pulling up, but I'm not, I'm not sharing it, but if you, if you had it in front of you, what you do is you count how many hexes between the firing unit and the blocking hex. So we got two hexes to that woods hex that's, that's, that's going to be possibly a blind hex. So two okay. hexes away, and the difference, is, the difference in levels is, is three levels, right? Because the woods are a one, and the, and the machine gun's up on a four hill. So according to the chart, that's a one hex blind spot. So basically anything, anything in, in these two hexes here, you would not be able to see, but you would be able to see him here. Okay. Okay. All right. Yep. Now, if we change that just a little bit, um, let's use the printed values for the hills. Okay. So now he's on a level two hill. And um, again, this woods is level one. So he's two hexes away, but now there's only a difference of one level. So two hexes away with a difference of one level is gonna be, again, a one hex blind spot. So it's gonna be uh, in here. Um, if he were, well, let's just, let's say we could move this hill back one. Sure. He, if he were three hexes away, just, just, just move this level two hill back here and ignore the trees. Yeah. Th this tree, so he's at level two, this is at level one. According to the chart, that would be a two hex blind spot, right? So that okay. line of sight, so the blind hex is going to extend to where he can't see that unit because he's too, he's too low in comparison to the woods he's shooting over, right? But if that, if that unit were farther back, Right, then you'd be able to see him. Is that helpful? Very yes. helpful. Thank you. What else, guys? Uh, can you explain how the contour lines that don't have elevation numbers affect gameplay? So below one. Essentially, the way um, the way to uh, the, the way to approach those as if is as if they were hills, they're just only hills you're looking at when you're on the same level. So um, maybe a sort of semi-simple example. Um, put this guy here, put this guy over here. Okay. Um, I can't see the... Let's see the line. Uh, actually, let's well, let me find. You get you gotta find the tr the examples here that are sure. This is a good one. All right, so these guys are on the same level. They're at level zero. If I, if I try and shoot, I've got this uh, contour line between them. You see how it crosses like this? You, so you're imagining what this, what this contour represents is the sort of the, the, where the hill starts to proceed up. So from here, well, get the line of sight thing out of the way. From here, the hill is gradually ascending, right? 
Um, so, so it's like 20 or it's like 10, 20, 30, it's like about, about 40 feet or so. If, if he was, um, if he was up here, you'd still look at it in the same way that he's crossing this contour line that the same level. So he can't quite see down below that hill. It's, it's the same as if you were on a hill trying to look from, from too far back on the hill, if that makes sense. Okay. But sure. you know, if the machine gun were, ah, there we go. The machine gun to say over here, you trace that line of sight. Um, you're, you're, you're really just looking at where's the dot and where are yeah. the dots between them. That, does that make sense? So as long as they're at the same level, you're just going to be looking at those thin lines to see if they're going to be um, kind of at the same level or a different level or if they're, you know, a different level between them. So I think for those two so the, hexes. So those two ahead. units see each other, but if the dot in between them was covered by a one hill, then they wouldn't see each other. Correct. But also in this particular instance, let's check the line site. Uh, what you'll notice is this is kind of the first contour where this dot is. And if you count up, this is the second contour. But this this one here that is passing through is actually a higher contour. So this would be this line of sight that I'm showing here would be blocked because you got just this little bit of a, a bulge of the the side of the hill as it's rising, blocking them so they can't quite see around it. Now, if the line of sight was you know up onto the hill then it wouldn't matter because you're at two different levels. So you just ignore the small thin lines. The rule of thumb is if one of the units is past a dark, a dark black line, that's a different level. And so you ignore the, you ignore the thin contours. If they're at the same level, then you have to take into account the contours. Interesting. Okay. In, in practice, what it's doing is instead of everything just being flat and you're either like shooting past the hill or not or whatever, it gives sort of these, I don't know, terrain undulations that, that make it a little bit trickier to see line of sight. But also, you know, you can run now around the side of a hill without having to actually expose yourself. And even you can, you can find these little um, pockets or defilades that give you some cover and, and ability to be, you know, out of line of sight of the enemy. So it's kind of cool in that respect. So if they're on the same level in that example right there on the left side of the map, there are actually three little increasing levels of hill underneath the one level. Yeah, yeah, you could kind of look at it that way. So again, so, so we, we I was just, just going to say, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the road there, which has all kinds of contour stuff going on. That right. would be a nightmare. I mean. Right. I well, mean, except that, except it roads in the woods, um, they're 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 a little bit different. The line of sight is limited anyway. Um, but yeah, that would be kind of that would be kind of wonky. The the scenario that uses this this is mission. This is mission. Two, isn't it? Yeah, two. Um, this one is just. I mean, there's the lines of sight on this one are really tricky, um, and uh, and there's not really a lot of room for shooting. It's all about maneuvering which I think is the point of the of this mission is it's like kind of full on assault from the start. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, but um, if I, if I remember correctly, when, when you non vehicular units are in woods on a road, um, they have a limited line of sight that they can shoot at anyway. I want to say it's, they can't shoot like beyond one or two hexes. Um, yeah, I think it's two. Yeah. Um, and if I hesitate, it's because we, we, that's changed a little bit. We were playtesting Airborne, so I've got, you know, again, you, you playtest, you got like six versions of rules in your head. Um, uh, but yeah, so I mean, those, those contours would kind of get tricky. But, you know, the rule of thumb, if you're on the same level, check the thin lines. If you're at different levels, you can ignore the thin lines. And of course, you can always fire it in adjacent hex. So. And the, the center dot determines your place completely. Yeah, it's, it's hard and fast, right? Yep. 
All right, guys, would you uh, permit me to pause for one second here? Sure. Just welcoming Mike Denson. I said it because we're, uh, we're recording, nice. uh, recording the session. So just talking about everybody's favorite topic, contours. So, okay. Yeah. What about them? Uh, I don't know. We, saw, we, we answered all the questions. <laughs> well, you're just too good. Any, uh, what, what else you got for me, guys? Let's uh, put this back up here. I love the Sherman behind you, dude. That's, that's really cool. That's uh, my backyard, man. <laughs> <laughs> so who do we have with us? Uh, a bunch of random dudes from the internet. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know who these guys are, but uh, I'm sure we're all friends now. <laughs> I don't know, you guys, you guys are in the Facebook group, I guess, mostly, Board Game Geek? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, Facebook group. Yeah, link on Facebook. Okay, cool. Um, what other questions or things you want to know about? Can you talk about armor? Or? Sure. Not totally clear on is reacquiring concealment. Uh, well, if you're, out, if you're well, out of line of sight, then you can reconceal. Yeah. So during the the, the last step of the the turn, the last phase of the turn, the the adjustment stuff. Um, if a unit's out of line of sight of the enemy, you can throw a concealment marker on it. Um, but what if you're in woods and you fire and they saw you because you're in the woods at the end of the turn? Can you reconceal? Uh, not if they can still see you. So, for example, let's so say once they see you, they see you. Yeah. So this American unit here, you know, he's, you know, he fires at the Germans. Um, in, in fact, since he's within two, since he's within two, when he fires, he would lose his concealment. And as long okay. as they, you know, now let's say they react for whatever reason and run over here, okay? At the end of the turn, well, he's out of line of sight of the German. Actually, the right. German's out of line of sight of him. They would both get concealment markers, so. It's just a check that you make at the end of the turn, and if anyone qualifies, they'll, they'll get that concealment again, which may or may not be useful. I mean, if they're in cover or something, that's helpful. If uh, if not, then it's not going to help them. If they move, you know, in the open or whatever, they'll lose it. They'll lose it quick. Is there so a once they once they see you fire at them, unless the position changes, they're always going to have their eye on you. Uh, yep, yep. So as long as you as long as you can see them, they'll be uh, they'll be able to. Uh, Keep you from concealment. Now, I'm trying to think here. Let me make a comment here. <clears throat> uh, Go ahead, Mike. Concealment doesn't mean you can't be seen. In in the game, I meant for concealment to be that I know you're there. I just have not I have not um, identified the specific location. <clears throat> so. Losing your concealment means that now I've specifically identified the location within that 50 yards. <clears throat> so until you back out of that hex or till I move somewhere else I can't see you, then I, I've identified your position. That's why you lost the concealment. That's it. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yep, same here. Tanks. Who asked for tanks? <laughs> well, here's the, here's the three rules of tanks. Okay, you always want to fire first, <clears throat> uh, and if you're not firing, you better be moving. And it's always the one you didn't see that gets you. So that's my motto. We'll just, uh, we'll put a couple on here. Let's see, what is that? The, uh, was that a, a Panzer? Can't tell what that is. Is that a Panzer IV? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like, um, like, like the other aspects of the game, um, the armor's organized uh, generally by platoon. Sometimes, I think there's a few missions where individual armor units will be like kind of support units. The thing to remember is um, you'll activate 
armor generally as its own platoon activation. So, um, you know, so like we had, like the first mission we had, you know, let's say we had second platoon, third platoon, and let's say you had four tanks from German, you know, third tank platoon. So those tank, that tank platoon would activate by itself. Or again, if you got coordination, remember when you activate the company, so instead of saying, I'm going to do all my actions with second and third platoon, instead I'm going to act with second platoon and my tanks from third tank platoon. Um, now, interestingly enough, since the armor was in support of the infantry, if tanks are stacked with infantry, then those armor units can be activated. Actually, the vehicle, well, yeah, the armor units can be activated along with the infantry in that platoon without it being a, um, without it having to be a coordinated thing, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, they, they act a little bit more like support units. So if you they cannot activate with the tank. Correct. So you, you can't say I'm going to activate my tank platoon and all the guys that are stacked with them can also activate. It's, it's, it's one sided. But in that sense, they're acting like support units so they, they can activate uh, with the with the, uh, the infantry units. So anti tank fire, pretty straightforward. Um, that's the number in the upper left. So it looks like this Sherman. It's got a straight up uh, five firepower. There would not be any modifiers. This guy's out in the open. He's not moving or anything. So you would put on him a uh, – you'd get a five anti-tank marker. Okay. Then when you resolve that, it's resolved against this bottom right number, which is his uh, – essentially his front armor, his main armor. But you notice that tanks have um, a smaller armor number, and that's their enfilade armor. So from other games, you think of like side armor, rear armor, something like that. Well, when do you get to use that? In reaction, so um, if, I have, if this tank is here, and now let's put this guy over here, just because. Um, let's say this tank is here and he moves here. Let me redo that so I can watch the trail. If he moves here, um, you're going to imagine a line. You now, let me do it this way. A line that his front 180 is going to be his front for in terms of reaction, okay? So if, if that tank is sitting still, no matter, which, no matter which angle I shoot him from, it's gonna be against that nine armor. But if he just moved, then it's considered that he's moving in this direction. So let's put a, uh, mm, there it is, all right. And we want to, All right, hold on a second. I'm gonna rotate this here. I don't know why that's not rotating. Why is it not rotating? Rotate. Anyone else see that? Anyone else see that not rotating? Anyway, pretend this arrow is pointing in the direction he moved, okay? Mm -hmm. So that, that tells you for this, just for this next reaction. So, so the tank moves, the Germans say, okay, reaction. This tank, when this tank fires on him, okay, he's going to get a uh, minus one because the, the, the target's in motion, right? So that minus one is going to be a net. Um, net four, okay, so five firepower with a minus one for because he's moving. This tank, however, if you look at the line of sight, if he reacts, He's firing in, in the back half of that 180. So that's considered an enfilade shot. It would be the same thing. It would be a five, it'd be a minus one, but instead of being a four, it would be a four enfilade, right? You know, it, it, it's the last hex side crossed that dictates the front and rear. Right. 
and the, and the front and rear is delineated by the, the, the 180 mark through there, right? So, so it's this hex side right here, since he moved across it, right? Does that make sense though? So you, you don't have to take into account turret direction or anything like that. You simply get an advantage if you're firing at a, if you're reaction firing against a unit that moved in a certain direction and would give you a shot basically on its rear. So if we, you know, if we rolled those, we rolled those hits, we'll do the enfilade and then the other one. So you've got either a 14 versus a six or a 13 against the nine. Either one's going to kill the tank, but you get the idea. Um, you know, rolling with the same plus four, obviously you're going to do better against the rear armor, the, you know, versus the enfilade with the enfilade shot, right? So the six. And that's, um, I don't know, I, I personally think that's a, I like that design, design decision, Mike, because it just keeps it simple. You're not having to fiddle with turrets. Um, you're just kind of assuming they're moving in their hex and aiming their turret where they need to. Um, but if they, if they do sort of a, if they're not cautious, that can, that can cost them by taking a shot where they don't want to get hit. Right. The key, the key there's, there's no facing. So if this unit did not take its reaction shot now, if it fired at the tank in another impulse, it would not, it would not get the enfilade. It's only at the moment of reaction. Hmm. Yeah. So, so again, um, you know, let's say the situation is now reversed. It's the Americans turn. Um, they activate both of these tanks to fire. They're just going to both fire against that nine. You know, if he, if, if he's got the motion marker on him, then, you know, they would still take that penalty and so on, but there's no enfilade shot there. Yeah. So show them the, like, some of the things that, that the Panzer IV could do, like a shooting scoot or something to avoid the enfilade or uh, yes. Right. So let's say that, that um, I don't know, let's say there's a bridge over here or something like that. Um, the Panzer wants to move. He could reverse move here. All right. If he reverse moves, then the, the hex side he crosses, but you would assume that he's facing this direction, right? Since he's reversing. So both of those shots, oops, sorry. Both of those shots are going to be versus his front, right? His main armor because he's reversing. So that's the case that you would use reverse. Um, units don't fire, units either shoot and then start moving or they, they come to a stop after they, or they, they come to a stop and then fire. So there's not actually, um, if, if they shoot and then scoot or if they halt and then fire, they'll take motion penalties on their fire, but they're not, I mean, it's not like other games where there's, you know, rolling along and shooting while they're rolling along. So they're, they're going to be either stopped before they stopped when they, they're going to be stopped when they shoot. And it's limited to an adjacent head. Right. So, um, so he, he's moving, he could move here and halt and fire, halt and fire. Well, hold on. Let me, let me adjust this here. So he's got the red, he's got this marker on. He could stop in his hex right and shoot in which case um in which case he would uh he still has that motion penalty he could also move one hex and do the same thing come to a halt and fire it would be a minus two likewise if he wasn't moving he could start up in motion or he could shoot he could shoot and then start moving and if he shoots and moves one hex, again, he'd take a minus one versus, or he'd take a minus two. So, so there's some there's different options for, for stuff like that. And I think, um, now correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but if, if he's in this situation, if he fires at this unit here, this unit would get an enfilade reaction, correct? Well, if he doesn't if he move. Did a, not if he did a shoot and scoot. Right, but but if, yes, but if he didn't move, oops, we lost our tank. Oh, if he didn't move, yeah, there's two types of enfilade against armor. One relative to maneuver, and it's against the last hex side cross. The other is based on fire. If he fires out one hex, the hex side that he fires from dictates his frontal. So anything to the rear 
if he receives a shot in reaction, would be enfilade. So, and in your case, if the Panther four fired at number two Sherman, he would be subject to enfilade from the Sherman number one. Right. Wow. Yep. So, so there's ways to avoid that. So in this case, he'd probably want to fire and then scoot back, maybe reverse or whatever, just to keep his front, you know, you know, like any, like a lot of tactical games, right? Keep your front towards the enemy. Keep the front of the tank towards the enemy, so. Any questions? What other things you guys want to see? These guys are awful quiet, Mark. Mark. <laughs> well, they've been, we've been, we've been having, we've been, uh, we're all, we're all scared you're here, Mike. We're, you're in, we're all, uh, <laughs> pump them up, okay? <laughs> no, we, uh, we, we've got some good examples. I hope it's, uh, I hope it's been helpful for everybody, so. Yeah. Absolutely. Very helpful. Yeah, very much. Yes. Yep. Uh, let's talk a moment about tactics. Uh, if you're interested with sure, armor. Definitely. Um, typically, typically the American, typically the Shermans are outgunned. And so the most interesting thing is, well, how do you, how do you work against uh, an enemy that's generally a little more deadly? Uh, <clears throat> so if you're American, if I had a single platoon moving against this panther, I would do the leapfrog approach. I would have two tanks stationary, ready to fire. I would move, maneuver another two tanks toward the panther. The only way the Sherman is gonna take out the panther is get and circle him more or less so he can get an enfilade. So basically, you're gonna try and rush the panther. So I would have, <clears throat> if I got to go first as the American player, I would take three Shermans with a platoon. I would fire at the Panther, which then would suppress him twice because for each, for every two uh, fire markers on the Panther, he reduces his fire by one. So I would take three Shermans, fire at the Panther and suppress him. Now his return fire is gonna be a six. I take the other two Shermans and I would move them as fast as they could go to try and get in and around behind the Panther. And hopefully that I get to go first the next time. <laughs> at so, that point you will lose the initiative roll. That's right. <laughs> yeah. you, have to, you have to do it in leaps and bounds. So if, if I have two platoons of Shermans, I'm going to have one platoon all close together stationary. So if there's any threat that pops up, I can react. I'm going to take the other platoon and I'm going to maneuver. Now the next turn, I'm just going to alternate. The platoon that maneuvered now is stationary because I'm going to stop them. They're going to provide cover fire for my other Sherman platoon now that, now that fired originally is now going to maneuver. So that's going to how, from a tank perspective on the attack, that's how you're going to have to do that. You don't ever want to get one or two tanks isolated and he's got another six tanks. So for the German player, we'll look at the other side. And it's historically, most of the time, the German units were outnumbered, both on the east front and the west front. So, <clears throat> You know, they want to try and isolate where they can get one or two of their guys against a couple of, of the Shermans. But you don't want to get in a situation where you've got one Panzer IV or even a Panther and you've got five Shermans firing at you. That's uh, not a healthy case. So especially for Tigers and Panthers, the shoot and scoot and halt and fire is really good for them because their gun is so good. They can fire at a shoot and scoot and halt and fire, and it only drops from eight to a six. If you got a Sherman, it's going to drop from either three to a one or four to a two or five to a three. So, guy in the Panther tactically has to use more maneuver. Um, so, you, you counteract the firepower with numbers, and for the or the German, you've, you've, you've got to set your position up so that no, if I'm going to have, if I'm defending with a German 
I'm going to have two tanks in the same head. So in other words, you don't want a single where the guy can gang up on you. So anyway, that's, that's some brief tactics. Uh, it, it's very, very much a cat and mouse game with armor. One of the things you'll you'll notice in the in the rules and so on is there's some there's some pretty good nuances. Um, for example, uh, you can do um, you can fire twice as long as you're firing out of the same hex side. So this this tiger could actually fire at both these Shermans uh, since since that fire is coming out of the same hex side. Now in this particular situation it might not be so good because that that Sherman back here will get an enfilade shot. But you, I mean you get the idea. You can uh, you can dual fire them. Um, there, there's another cool, there, the one thing that there's, you know, some games you got sort of like the tank duel. Um, so if you have two tanks that, that are firing at each other and they're only firing at each other and they both die, you, you, you sort of roll off and only one of them dies randomly. So it's kind of like a, you know, a tank on tank duel sort of thing. So there's, there's little nuances like that in the rules that, that give some flavor and detail and make it, you know, make you think about the tactics real carefully. So Mark, you just Mark, you just described a split fire from that yeah. panther. To, yeah. To, so then, the, and then those minuses apply. Yeah, to, they would. So it'd be minus, a minus uh, uh, minus two, I think, for a split fire. And so the main difference between split fire for, um, we'll say, for infantry, is infantry can come out of two hex sides, whereas armor can only come out of one. Yeah. The other right. thing is infantry split fire is limited to units with a firepower of one or more. Right. And uh, it's got to be reaction. It's a reaction fire, right? Reaction fire. Basically, oh. you know, transverse the machine or, you know, spinning the machine gun on a tripod or whatever. Or maybe whatever they do following the, the, the guys. But, yeah, that's a little bit difference there. Um, but the split yeah. fire can be useful. I, I mean, that seems like a good big penalty, but maybe not for the Tiger with eight firepower. Well, it's firing at two sixes. <laughs> right. Well, the... the the Germans with a long range gun, they want to keep you at a distance. And so once the Shermans start getting within a move, within, you know, one move from them, it's time to move and get out. Right. I, I mentioned before the scenarios kind of work their way up into things. So like, you know, mortars come in in scenario three. And then this is, this is one of the maps from scenario five, um, which is all tanks. So it's a good way to learn the, just, just the tanks. Um, same activation reaction. Uh, which makes it, you know, makes it fluid and smooth. But then, um, you know, you just get to practice with tanks. And come on, who doesn't want just a tank on tank battle once in a while, blowing stuff up? Anything else you guys want to know or talk about? Or uh, yeah, just uh, just out of curiosity, the tanks have such range. Um, do you have, do you have matches with this close proximity, or is it usually much further apart? Well, in the tank game, you can, um, although the Americans have to drive the Germans off of these, um, these bridge, bridge access points uh, in that particular mission. So, I mean, they're going to have to close eventually. So like Mike said, I mean, you got to figure out a way to sort of swarm them. In, in typical, in more typical scenarios, you're really going to use the tanks, I think, more as the close infantry support. So you're going to use them for assaulting along with infantry. Um, then the tank and the tank battles would be a lot closer, which I think is pretty typical of the Western Front. I mean, unlike you know, like the Soviet, like out on the steps when the Russians and Germans are just blasting each other at ranges and the Tigers just killing everything. Um, I think like in, in you know France, um, typically we're just like shorter range battles because you're in, in among the hedgerows or in the woods and stuff like that. And is that does that sound about right, Mike? Yeah, you're you're perfectly correct. The in the West in the West Front, mostly France, Belgium. You know, there was some long range gunning, but uh, the terrain was much tighter. Whereas on the east front, uh, it, you, you, on the steps and others, the distance was much greater. So on the west front, that was another advantage that the Allies or the Shermans had, although they had a lesser gun, most of the combat probably was at four to 500 yards. Uh, so it's really, it's really a terrain issue. If you're, are you asking, are there missions that they're longer range? Yes, yeah, in the first module, uh, when you get to the last couple of missions where there are um, a lot more maps involved, you'll have greater distances. 
But you know, if you're German, man, you really want to, you really would like to be shooting up there at 30 hexes. <laughs> so and that's probably what I've been, those are the mistakes I've been making is I'm looking at the stats and I'm not thinking about all this historical perspective that you've brought to the game. So, I mean, you know, I want to do it at range because I can, and that's maybe not the smartest move. Well, you, you know, you have much better chance at, if, if I'm playing the Germans, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try and gauge the enemy. You know, obviously we're limited here on the West front because it's rain, but I'm going to try and engage him in this particular mission here, for example, that Mark has up. Uh, as soon as the American comes on the board, if, if I have a shot, I'm taking it, okay? Because uh, I want to get as many shots in as I can. Uh, you know, then, you know, because the, Amer the Germans set up hidden here, you know, you got a stoog somewhere that maybe you can stick out on the flank and, and maybe suck the German in so you can get an enfilade. But the Germans really, if you got a good American player here and it plays his platoons, as I described earlier, it's really tough for the German because he's just going to have to take some pot shots and back up and it, uh, because he just won't be able to stand up to, you know, five or six Shermans at a time. Uh, on the East Front, we haven't done that yet, but there'll be some longer ranges, uh, you know, on the East Front. But even on the East Front, you know, it, it might be on the steps, you think of flat ground. Well, it's not really flat in the, the steps of Russia or Ukraine. You, you need to think of Western Kansas, okay? And it's kind of a rolling thing. And yeah, you may shoot the enemy at a mile away, but it's generally kind of from one rise to the next. So uh, there, are, there are undulations and things even there that you have to deal with. Obviously, if you read some, you read about some of these really long range shots, but I would say that that was not typical. Of course, the German would want to shoot as far as he could, but if you're a good tanker, you want to use your terrain just like the infantry does. You want to be able to get as close as you possibly can to him without being shot at. So moving around the edge of trees, behind hills and buildings is what it means. A tanker, we think of tanks as armor. You know, we don't think of the five people inside the tank. Whereas if you got a squad, you think of men. Well, there are men in the tank. They had the same self-preservation needs as the infantry. Right. So in the game to be successful, I find personally that, man, I hate to lose a tank, not so much because I need him, but it's a whole step and they go real quick against my casualties. So you find yourself, if you're good, you know, sneaking around or hoping that the other guy's gonna make a mistake, you're looking for an opening. Obviously, sometimes like in this particular mission, you have no choice as the Americans, you only got like 30 minutes to get the job done. So it's a matter of balancing your, your risk. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. Yeah, it's lots to, lot to think about. Mike, is Michael Kirk here. You, you made some, uh, we talked a little bit about opportunity fire that wasn't there. You had some um, philosophy about, you know, not easily getting long opportunity fire shots that are built into the game. And I really liked hearing that. And that's part of this, right? The, well, the close, combat yeah. being closer in. Well, if we're, for armor, I get you want to talk about armor or infantry? <laughs> well, I'm thinking infantry more. Well, okay. So based on what I read and really think of, of the behavior of small unit combat, self-preservation is a really, really big part. So let's say, for example, that you're in a wood line and you're in a foxhole, you and your squad, you're spread out over, you know, you got a squad spread out over uh, 50 yards and, you know, 
10 yards and you got every 10 yards, you got a fox hole and you got two men in a hole and you see the Germans out there and maybe you just have to be in a situation where you know, they're 500 yards away. Well, yeah, you can shoot 500 yards, you can shoot 300 yards. But what you do is generally you'll give your position away and shortly you'll either be mortared or the guy's gonna pull up a tank and blast you out. So what I read is that the vast majority of small arms fire, although they can shoot four or five, 600 yards, which really to 100, 125 yards. So, you know, I, when you look at this setup right here and you think, oh, well, it's only two or three hexes away. Well, that's 150 yards. That American machine gun there, you know, is gonna try and pick out that squad sneaking through and using every bit of covers it possibly can at 150 yards away. That's a long shot. You give a hunter with a deer rifle, it's still a long shot. So yeah. most combat really and truly took place up close. So as far as opportunity fire, um, you know, some people say, well, as he moves between those two buildings, I should be able to shoot at him. Well, that's assuming you're ready and you're looking. Uh, but if there's a lot of firing going on or there's a mortar fire coming about, you know, uh, that's one of the reasons for the game to suppress the enemy uh, so that you can dash across that. Um, it, it's a mechanic. I found that it was not necessary. I find it's onerous where some games, you know, you, you, you move a unit of hex and you stop and you say, you want to fire? And he says, no, and then you move him in the next hex and he's, you want to fire? Um, you know, I don't, I reduced the movement allowance such that everything's kind of done in a smaller bite. Um, so, uh, it, it did, and it also, you can't, if you fire at every hex, you can't get this simultaneous feel. You get this, it's very sequential. And I wanted to do a game that felt like things were occurring as they do in reality, kind of in a, in a simultaneous aspect. You know, while somebody's firing, somebody's moving. It's not like I just have one guy moving and everybody's waiting to see him move. So it's, it's a little sacrifice, I guess you might say, um, we don't have opportunity fire here. What we do have uh, is a modifier that if you end your maneuver within two hexes, um, I think we call it proximity fire. Basically, it's a higher risk because you're now close range. So although you don't get to shoot at it as it moves, you do get a bonus when he starts getting close. So it's it still can be fairly lethal. If you move within two hexes of that machine gun, he's gonna get a plus one, so he's firing it at a plus two. If your cohesion's a six, then he's got a 60% chance of disrupting you, and he's got a 30% chance of a KIA. Well, that's a fairly high casualty rate. So, I don't, I don't know, Michael, if that answered your questions or not, but. Oh yeah, yeah, I love hearing that stuff, so, yeah. Um, yeah the I other thing you have to take into account is that you look at this map, it looks like everything's flat. Well, you know, there are, if you had a plowed field that had been leveled, it might be flat, but there's always undulations in the ground uh, that men could hit the ground and take cover from. Um, the grass could be high. I mean, I right now <laughs> where I live, you know, I got some grass that's three foot high. Jude, I could crawl up next to you and you probably wouldn't know if I was good enough. So it, it, you look at a map, it's all seeing. Uh, I try to create a situation where things kind of happen simultaneously. And to do that, there's some sacrifices made, but um, I think the proximity fire more than offsets the the overwatch or opportunity fire aspect. Yeah. I mean, having, having played a ton of, a ton of, a ton of games, I, I mean, it's not a mechanic I particularly miss. 
I mean, if a game has it, it's certainly useful in the context of the game, but since every game is different. Um, well, this one plays so much quicker and faster without it. That's, that's an advantage as well. You move your guys and, and then he gets to react. And when he's done, you move the next one. So it plays real quickly. Any other, uh, any other situations, comments, particular questions? Uh, how do so you what's this? Go ahead. I was going to say, what's coming up with the airborne then? What what does that add to the game, and and how is that playing since you're doing some testing on that, Mark? Well, Mark, do you want to comment on the airborne? Sure. So um, essentially, it's going to focus on um, Normandy uh, and then Market Garden. Um, the big mechanics that are going to come to the game are airborne drops. Um, so there's two big scenarios where you've got uh, you, you're dropping your sticks of guys in. Of course, they scatter all over the place. Um, there, there's kind of cool mechanics. So you, you plot out your drops ahead of time, and then you have to um, get to uh, you, you have to designate an assembly hex. So you really can't move on your objective hexes until you your platoon leader and some of your squads have reached the um, the object or the assembly hex. And then you can move on from there. So you you kind of you got to get a little bit of order out of the chaos after the drop. So there's two there's a couple of big drop scenarios, um, and then uh, there's night and twilight rules, which changes of course. Um, line of sight when when you gain and lose concealment uh, makes it a lot harder to see so for example at night um, you know you basically things are happening within one or two hexes uh, in order to be able to see it or, or, or you know lose be able to react to it um, let's see what else um, what was I gonna say? Night rule. so there's I think there's some British tanks in there uh, and then of course elite troops so you've got the airborne troops on both sides um, and, uh, and they get some special things. For example, they can go ahead and recover as a limited reaction, even if they didn't observe an enemy reaction. So they can basically, you know, uh, get themselves together without having, you know, seen something else going on. Um, they get like a bonus to their recovery role and, uh, and they got you know, typically um, better cohesion leaders, uh, so on. So, uh, and then. Let me comment on that. Mike? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. One of the challenges which I think was fun was trying to figure out, well, how are you going to differentiate and how elite units are different than regular units? What makes them different? Well, training, leadership, and et cetera, but how do you represent that in the game? Well, the easy way out is just increase the firepower for your elite unit and increase his cohesion and make him, you know, make that counter a monster counter. But really and truly, when you think about it, uh, take the US Airborne, for example, they use the same M1 Garand rifle as the regular infantry unit did. And I doubt that, you know, they were better shot. So why would I increase the firepower? For in this game, the cohesion, or when you disrupt, doesn't mean you panic or rout. It just means you're, you've gone to ground under heavy fire. And, and until you get your nerve back up or the fire goes away, you know, in essence, until you recover, you're just, you're just, you're just hunkering down. So you say, well, maybe we should make the elite a better cohesion. Well, but I don't think so. I mean, if, if an elite unit, he's just as smart as that regular unit, when he's taking a bunch of fire, he's gonna to go to ground. So what you'll find in the airborne units, that their firepower and their cohesion is pretty much basically the same as a regular unit. So as Mark referred to, what differentiates that is several factors. All your platoon leaders have a cohesion of seven. So they're gonna have a bigger influence on helping units stick in there when they're under fire uh, and other benefits. The other factor is, which he mentioned, is that elite units, they generally have better initiatives. So that means, you know, they don't, lead, they don't need a leader to help them recover. They can recover anywhere, basically because the NCOs are better trained. Uh, in, in addition, <clears throat> they get a minus one. The big advantage of another factor, I think, the, the elite units is they're much more inclined to get back in the fight much quicker. They're better trained, is free to core. So while that regular unit is having difficulty regrouping or recovering, that elite unit will have an advantage because he's going to get a modifier to recover. The other benefit as well is that if he gets a minus one on his die roll, well, that means he can now rally on a one or a two. 
instead of just a one. If he's got a leader, he's now going to rally on a one, two, or three. So the elite just kind of keep on coming. Uh, but the really biggest factor is a coordination role. The elite units get a plus three on, co on coordination. So that means 60% of the time, they're going to be operating with six squads and support units instead of just three. Mm -hmm. Where that really makes a difference is once you get in close to the enemy, you'll have units to suppress, you'll have units to encircle because you've got six or seven units to work with. So without increasing the firepower or the cohesion, you know, we, in, in using some of the softer, more subtle factors, aspects of the game, it, the, the elite units really perform as elite. They're just, they're just tough. You can disrupt them, but they're coming back quickly. And a lot of times they'll rally. And once they get amongst you, you know, they're going to almost encircle you every time. So that's my little story. That, and I'm proud of that because I think the leap, you can ask Mark, I think the leap piece works really good in the game. That's cool. There are uh, so some pretty, they're fun scenarios. There's little short ones and, you know, kind of big ones with the big drops and everything. So it's going to be a good module. And I think, uh, Looks like it's uh, what they say five to nine months out, maybe because I think art is mostly getting wrapped up, and so it's, it's moving along pretty good. We're hoping August or September. That's cool. Um, is there anything like Arnhem or anything bigger city fight or anything? And you know, I've been trying to get some. The Brits kept saying, "Well, when are you going to put Brits in the thing?" And I, I challenged a couple of them to come up with some you know, a little scenario pack for the Brits uh, in Arnhem. But in this particular model module, no, there's a there's a, a little larger urban village of St. Miraglis that we deal with. But other than that, there's no large urban fight in, in this one at this moment. Cool. Yep, Pegasus Bridge would be a great little add-on. Oh, it would be because I, 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 what I wanted them to do, to do about eight or 10 missions, part of them at the Orne River, uh, at Pegasus Bridge and the other at Arnhem, but I've got no one to step forward and I'm too heavily involved right now in the Russian theater and the Pacific theater. I just don't have time, but I'm hoping someone would step forward. We have the maps, uh, all we, and we have all the rules necessary. We just need somebody to step forward. Got, got a lot of listeners on here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, guys, it's, it's been a couple of hours. I think it's probably a good time to, to maybe wrap it up. Uh, any final thoughts or questions for me or Mike? or? Yeah, for either one of you. On the coordination role, both Mike and uh, Mark, is that used usually when you roll for initiative each round? You just use that number for your coordination number? Or do you, is that, are everyone... Just when, rolling, it, rolling again to see if they, they when get you, it. When you select your initiative. company, uh, then you'll make your coordination role. So the initiative role is, is independent of that. So whoever, whoever oh, gets the initiative, you know, then the, the active player will say, well, okay, so I'm activating, you know, like in, in that mission one, okay, I got second, second company and I'll roll for coordination. If I get it, then I can activate both platoons at once. And so you don't have a separate to do role. In oh, your, good. In your, if you win coordination, let's say you have a company with three platoons, if you win coordination, you don't have to do it on the first activation. You could just activate one platoon in the first activation and try and draw as much reaction as possible. And then once you've drawn fire and reaction, then you can activate the two. So there's lots and lots of subtle aspects to draw the, it, that's a good example. I use a platoon to suppress and draw fire. And now I have two more platoons that I can now maneuver. So there's a lot of subtle things you can do in tactics. Um, another real simple example is if I got a single platoon, you know, I can take one squad to suppress, I can maneuver another squad up next to your unit, assuming we're close enough, which you know I wouldn't do until I got close enough. So I'm really putting you on the horns of the dilemma. I suppressed you. If you don't fire at the guy that moves Jason to you, 
then the next turn he's liable to just get in your hex and you can't do anything about it. But I've also got that third squad with a leader sitting over there. So as soon as you fire at that other squad, now I can react with the leader in the second squad, then move up adjacent. So no one can, assuming you didn't have other units then, then no one would be able to fire. So there's, once you, the game, it has lots of depth. Once you really begin to play, I don't want to call them tricks, but you learn good tactics that you can do. It's not written in the rules that all these things can happen. You have to learn the rules and, and get together and realize, in the, for the examples I just made, on how you can take advantage. So it's kind of like being in the, being learning to be an officer. You know, you, you, they teach you at school, they teach you in the books, but once you get out there and start fighting as an NCO and officer, you begin to learn better tactics, timing, when to do this, when to move that unit there, when to support, uh, when to suppress. Um, in, it kind of like, in some ways, it's like a basketball game. You set up a play to set the guy up. So uh, it, it, it has a lot of depth. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard to get good at it. It takes a while, you know, but it's worth it. It's very rewarding once you begin to realize the potential uh of what your units can do as far as timing and sequencing uh etc right great michael how you doing doing good that's good <laughs> listen guys i appreciate you taking some time tonight to look over the game and uh you know learn it better and uh, thanks, Mike, especially for uh, for joining us. Uh, like I said, we're gonna. Um, this is recorded, so I'm gonna put up on my YouTube channel, so anybody else wants to take a look at, it, they can. And maybe we do it again sometime, or uh, you know, and uh, well, Mark, I'm or whatever. But really uh, grateful, and thanks very much for putting this together. This is fun. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll meet like, we need to meet like this every Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Say, yeah, really thank you very much for your time here. Yes. Oh, you're welcome, guys. Yeah, I think, uh, Mark. I wonder if someone could we could do a live play sometime. Yeah, let's. Uh, we'll, we'll plan it. We can have a. Uh, well, touch, play in touch. So, all right, cool. Well, That's thanks everybody for the support of the game. Um, you know, we hope to continue and add more modules and make more fun. Um, so, thank you again for your support. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, thanks thank for all your. Thank you. Support. Great work, Mike and Mark, for supporting the game. It's really awesome. Well, uh, Michael Kirk is, was really instrumental in helping get getting the living rules up to where they are. Uh, he did a lot of editing and helping us do that. Uh, Mark has been tremendously helpful. Geez, he, he beats me to all the all the all the board game deep questions, and <laughs> that's uh, that's because I'm not retired, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I have more free time. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> We all get to the point where there's a strong community that we can all work together to make this a better game uh, and more games and more modules. So uh, it, I appreciate all the help and support of you guys. And um, uh, anyway, thanks, Mark. Mike. Yeah. Thanks.